Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, thanks for making me the new science advisor. Um, I am a mycologist. My uh, PhD is in plant pathology because you can't get a PhD in mycology. Um, you have to get it in ecology or genetics or forestry or something else. Um, but I got mine in plant pathology on potato pathogens, actually. Um, and I currently work for the USDA. Um, and my job is to identify fungi. So I get in samples from ports, from universities, from uh, people across the US, and we do our best to put a name on what we get in. Um, so most of what I work on are microfungi. Over the eight years I've been in this position, I think I've seen mushrooms maybe three or four times. Almost everything else is microfungi. Um, of course, when people hear that I'm a mycologist, usually they don't know what that means. And um, if they do, they think, oh, like mushrooms. And then they want to point out every mushroom in the neighborhood and ask me what it is. And I tell them I have no idea. And then they wonder what kind of mycologist I am because I don't really seem to know anything. So um, the title that I came up with for this talk, I try to be a little catchy about titles. Um, so, and I'll tell you where this came from. The original title was Rust, Smut, Mildew, and Mold. Um, I added the invisible fungi in your neighborhood. Um, or microscopes make many things more interesting. And I thought about making that alliterative and having it be microscopes make mycology marvelous or something like that. Um, but uh, that might be microscopist and um, against all of the mushrooms that also make mycology pretty marvelous. All right, so the title came from a necklace that a friend of mine gave me. Um, she went on Etsy, I think, and, and bought this necklace, Rust, Mut, Mildew, and Mold. And when I got it, I thought, you know, this looks familiar, and I think I know where it came from. So I went down to the U.S. National Fungus Collections Library, which is in the building where I work, um, and we have a large library with six compactors and, and shelves and shelves of books. And I found these two books by a mycologist named Mordecai Cubit Cook. And Mordecai Cubit Cook was a British mycologist. Um, he lived in the 1800s, early 1900s. And he wrote this book, Rust, Smut, Mildew, and Mold, published it in 1865. There were a few editions. This was a later edition. And you can tell that you know, the Etsy person took the cover, it is quite a pretty cover, and made this necklace. So having this book in hand, I started looking through it. Um, and this was Mordecai Cubit Cook's Introduction to the Study of Microscopic Fungi. Like I said, published in 1865. Um, Mordecai was the president of the Society of Amateur Botanists. He um, actually founded a number of naturalist um, societies around London. And so he put together this book. It's got some beautiful watercolors of, these are mostly rusts. And so this kind of gave me sort of the scaffold for the talk. I, I was gonna make something sort of similar. So when you read the introduction to this book, he uh, mentions, in these latter days when everyone who possesses a love for the marvelous or desires a knowledge of some of the minute mysteries of nature has or ought to have a microscope, a want is occasionally felt which we have essayed to supply, and this want consists in a guide to some systematic botanical study. So he was saying there was nothing for the lay person who was interested in microscopic fungi that would guide them and, and give them something to, to use as kind of a guidebook. And his, his opinions on microscopes, Mordecai loved microscopes. Um, he founded the Quecket Microscopical Society in Britain. Um, his feelings on microscopes were echoed by an American mycologist, Lucien Underwood. And Lucian wrote this book, Molds, Mildews, and Mushrooms. And in his introduction, he says, when a compound microscope becomes as much of a household necessity as a clock or a piano, when children are early taught the nature study of everyday life and become familiar with the common things in nature around them, these ideas as to what the term plant life includes will not only cease to strike us as mysterious, but our range of available information will be infinitely extended. So I really like that idea that microscopes should be, become as much of a necessity of at least a clock Pianos aren't quite so necessary, but maybe an iPhone or an Echo or something like that these days. Um, so these are two mycologists from a long time ago, um, although mycology is still a pretty young discipline. Um, and one of the things I like about what I do is I also get a chance to study the history of mycology and to study mycologists. 
And of course, science is practiced by scientists who are humans, and humans do human things. So um, if we have time at the end, um, I'm going to tell you a couple stories about these two. Uh, there are some scandals that they were involved in. So if you stick around, you got, you'll get to hear a bit of micro gossip at the end. All right, so Mordecai wrote his book because he felt there was nothing for the layperson. And that's kind of still true today. Um, there's really no good guidebook to microfungi and land plants, especially for the US. Um, if you're interested in these fungi and, and you have a microscope or you're gonna get one and you want to look at these fungi, uh, this is an excellent book, Microfungi and Land Plants. It was written by two other British mycologists. It's about $70. Um, it covers fungi on wooden bark and leaf litter, specific to certain trees, on grasses, parasitic on rust and powdery mildews. It's got a lot of descriptions, and then at the end, it's got plates of all these line drawings. So this is on allium, so onions, leeks, um, garlic. These are a lot of different microscopic fungi that you might find on that host. Another really good book is Microfungi on Miscellaneous Substrates by the same authors. Um, that one's about $45. And it has fungi on mosses, fungi on fungi, fungi on slime molds. So not only do you get slime molds on mushrooms, but you get fungi growing on slime molds, um, fungi on burnt ground, soil dung, et cetera. So one of the things I also wanted to talk about was I'm going to be showing a lot of micrographs. Um, and these will be mostly taken under a 60F subjective. So I wanted to talk about size and how small these things really are. Um, because when I talk about what I do, sometimes I'll tell people, how beautiful the spores are and how amazing it is. And it's hard to imagine something you've never seen. So I'm gonna show a lot of pictures. Um, but I also want you to keep in mind how small these things really are. So I'd mentioned to Tom having people have a, a ruler. Um, so this is the ruler that I use to take these pictures. And if you look at your ruler and you look at the size of a centimeter, I've got kind of a picture of a centimeter there. If you put this under a dissecting microscope, um, this is the whole centimeter all the way across at about 0.75x. And you can start to see that the lines that you normally might need reading glasses to see have started to blur a little bit. And you probably saw this in high school biology or college biology, looking under a microscope, the E from the newsprint, you saw the dots in it. So if we go in a little bit further, here's one millimeter and the lines begin to see all the dots in them. If we put it under a microscope at 4x, which is 40x what the eye can resolve, here's one division line and you can start to see all the little dots under the eight and in one line. And over here I have a scale bar and this is 100 microns. So one micron is one one thousandth of a millimeter. So if you look at your millimeter, imagine taking that millimeter and dividing it into a thousand pieces. And that's how small what we're looking at is you know, absolutely invisible to the naked eye, but this is how far down we've been able to go. Under the 20x objective, you're quite a bit closer. You can see all the dots under that eight and on that line. Under the 40x, you really start to resolve all the little dots that go into that, that line. And then most of the images that I'm gonna show you that are the highest resolution are gonna be under the 60x objective, which is 600 times what the eye can resolve. So here's our scale bar. So that's just something to keep in mind because some of these are pretty intricate and yet so very tiny. Um, another thing before I begin, I just was going to mention names. Um, I tried to put on whatever common name might occur for, for a lot of these. Um, some of them have common names, some have just kind of been thrown in there. Um, but I thoroughly encourage everybody to um, get comfortable with scientific names. Um, that also opens up a big world. Um, they're very descriptive often and can really tell you something about the history of what you're looking at. So these are some names that you'll see um, in this presentation. Um, Puccinia is the name of a rust and it's named after Tommaso Puccini, who is an Italian gallery director. Uh, Peronospora is another name that you're going to see, and peron means brooch, and spora means spore, should be an A there. Philosticta, philo of course means leaf, and sticta means spot, so that's a very descriptive name. And circospora, circ means rod, and spora means spore. So um, just to put up another reference, I don't know if you guys have 
spread around this book, but it's it's my favorite for um, Latin names for scientific names. Um, it's a great dictionary of word roots, and you can find most of the names that you might come across. Um, you can find the roots to them in this book. All right. So I'm going to be showing a number of pictures of microfungi. Uh, these are traditionally classified based on spore morphology. Um, with mushrooms, of course, you've got the cab, you've got the stipe, you've got the annulus, you've got all these other characters. Uh, the microfungi don't have that many characters or we can't see them. So traditionally it's been spore morphology, the shape, size, color, et cetera, and the spore ontogeny. How are they formed? So for that, the life cycle and reproduction are key, and I'm going to put up a few life cycle pictures as well. So when you think of spores, if you haven't spent a lot of time looking at various spores under the microscope, this might be what comes to mind, sort of one-celled oval things um, that fly through the air. And if you've mostly looked at spores of mushrooms, that's understandable. Um, some are hyaline or clear, some have color. But of course, with the mushrooms, it's the fruiting bodies that are the most interesting part. But if you have access to a microscope, um, you see something new. And for me, when I first started looking at mushrooms, all of a sudden these mushrooms just appeared that I swear had never been there before. And it was like a curtain had lifted and this whole world had appeared. And when I started looking under a microscope, especially a high powered, really good one, there was a whole nother curtain that sort of lifted and, and put me into this world, which quite frankly is a pretty great place to be. Um, whenever I don't wanna do anything else at work, I go to the microscope and pull out some samples and just sort of hide in, in, in the microscope space. So here are uh, a smattering of um, some of the spores that I've come across in samples that, oops, go to previous, in samples that have come through our lab. Um, so this is just an example of the diversity of some of the things that we can see under the microscope. Um, these are ascospores, and they look like little canoes with little ghost people sitting in them. There are a number of spores that have appendages, sort of a mucilaginous appendage on the end. This spore is associated with a lichen. Um, this is a pretty common spore, it looks like a little rocket ship. Um, so there's really, when I talk about how beautiful these spores are, this is the amazing diversity that you can see um, once you start to look at these things under the microscope. Uh, they can also be a little bit whimsical. Um, this is a fungus called a tar spot fungus that occurs on cinnamomum leaves. And it usually makes little squiggles in these circular um, lesions, but this one happened to be smiling at me. Um, I see little hearts and mittens. And this one, the fungus was producing this sort of tube, we call it a cirrus of spores that was coming out. Um, and it made this heart, and this happened to be on my birthday, so I felt like the fungus was maybe, you know, saying something to me. All right, so let's get on to the main part of this talk, which is a few of the rust, smut, mildew, and mold of the DMV. And uh, Lamont talked about um, having sort of a tasting menu of slime molds, and I thought this was sort of a tasting menu of these groups. This is, of course, four big groups. Um, I'm not gonna be able to go into detail really on any of them. I might go a little bit quickly. Um, this will be available to anybody afterwards um, who wants to go back through any of these pictures and see any of this. Um, I stole this image from um, the Q State of the World's Fungi Report from 2018. And I quite, like it. Um, a lot of people have put up phylogenetic trees and that's sort of what this is, but it shows, like we know, that fungi are more closely related to animals than they are to plants and other kingdoms. And it shows several of the phyla and kingdom fungi, the mucromycota, chytridiomycota, and I'm not going to talk about any of those. And then the two big ones, the basidiomycota and the ascomycota. And of course, in the Basidio mycota, you have the mushrooms and the jelly fungi and the brackets and the big fungi that you can see when you're walking through the woods. And you also have the rest and the smuts, which are kind of, of the microfungi, kind of the big ones. And there are about 50,000 species in the Basidio mycota that we know of. The largest group by far is the Ascomycota, and this is where you find a lot of the microfungi. Um, 
the lichen, the fungal symbiont in lichens is in the Ascomycota. Many yeasts are in the Ascomycota, although you can have the Cidiomycete yeasts. And then these groups, which aren't really taxonomic groups, but they're more convenience groups, the parasitic microfungi, the endophytes, and the molds. And of course, what distinguishes these two is how the spores are produced. So in the Ascomycota, spores are produced inside a sac, an ascus. So here you have eight spores inside this ascus. And in the Basidiomycota, the spores are produced on a basidium. And here we have an agaricus with it's basidium and the stigmata and a spore being produced. So there are a few rusts, that, well, there are several rusts you can see in, in this area. And I was just gonna go through some of them. Um, going back to Mordecai's book, he begins it sort of as a, as a discussion. It's meant for lay people. And he, he talks about, you know, if we take a stroll away from London, um, we'll find this plant. And he talks about, you know, it'll look like it's sprinkled with gold dust, um, seeming as though some fairy folk had scattered over them a shower of orange-colored chrome or turmeric powder. So I guess in my mind, I imagine this sort of like a, a walk through the neighborhood, showing some of these fungi um, and then showing them under the microscope. Oops. So we're going to start with the rusts. And Emily Bruns gave a great talk about rust a number of months ago and went through the life cycle of rusts. Uh, I was going to just put this up here and go through it quickly. Um, rusts are in the Basidia mycota because they make Basidia with Basidia spores. Um, but they also make several other structures and they have a pretty complicated life cycle. So you start in the spring with one end haploid spores that land on receptive hyphae in a spermatogonia. Those grow with two nuclei, dicaryotic mycelia, through the host and produce a structure called mycidium, which looks like a little cup. They're also called cluster cups. That produces these spores, esiospores or cidiospores, which are still dicaryotic. And those then jump host. And they'll go to a different host on which they'll produce a structure called a uridium or a uridinium. They make uridinia spores that then can continue infecting the host throughout the growing season. Later on, a structure will be produced called a telium, which contains telia spores, which are sort of a resting spore. That's where meiosis will happen, the basidium will be formed, and you'll have basidia spores, which will go back to the original host plant. So there are several fungi in the area where you can see examples of at least Esia, Uridinia, and Telia. Seeing Basidia and Spermatogonia is rarer in the rust. I've seen Basidia a number of times when we've had sort of older samples and Spermatogonia a few times. But seeing these forms at the bottom is a lot easier and a lot of rust in the area. So I was going to go through five common local rusts. Um, Penstemon andropogon rust, where you can see Esia. Mock strawberry rust, where you can see uridinia. Mist flower rust, where you can see uridinia and telia. Cedar quince rust, where you can see Esia and telia that form on, an alternate, on alternate hosts. And um, may apple rust. So, Penstemon digitalis is a common plant to grow in um, pollinator gardens and native plant gardens. So, it's the beard tongue. And there's a rust that grows on beard tongue and blue stem, or penstemon and andropogon, pogon. so it's a penstemon andropogonus rust. Here's the penstemon growing in the spring, and if you look closely, you might see on the underside of some leaves with a leaf spot, these little concentric orange circles, little targets. So that's kind of interesting. You walk by it in the morning and think that's kind of, you know, interesting. Here's the alternate host, andropogon or blue stem grass. And it's when you get it into the lab under the microscope that things get even more exciting. So this is under the dissecting microscope and all those little clusters make these cups. These are the esial cups. The white is peridial cells and then the yellow is all the spores. And if you slice through a few of these, then you can see this cup form Here's the leaf, cross-section of the leaf. 
here's your little cluster cup and your chains of ECSPs. And if you go up more go up more closer closely, you can see the pretial cells on the side, you can see the ECSPs forming in chains, and they'll even come off in chains like this. And again, notice the scale bar, 100 microns, 100 one one thousandth of a millimeter, and here you can see these ornamented little spores that are invisible to the naked eye. Another one that you might see that you have to really look for is mock strawberry or Duchesnia rust or Potentilla rust, Phragmidium mexicanum. So I was out in the garden one day and we have our air dryer over here. I was hanging up some clothes and looked down at the lawn and we've got mock strawberry all over the lawn. And if you look closely, you can see these little brown spots on the mock strawberry leaves. And I actually thought this was gonna be something else. So when I turned it over, I noticed that on the underside of the leaves, and you've got the um, clothespin here for reference, there were these sori, these pustules of orange um, spores. And this one, when you take it in and make a cross section, you've got uridinia spores. They're maybe not the most exciting ones. They're not super ornamented. You can see a little bit of ornamentation. Um, they're pretty little things. But if you wait until the end of the summer, then you are rewarded by these teleospores, which are pretty interesting. Um, and again, it's hard to believe that something like that is coming from these little spots on the wild strawberry. Um, if you go back to your native pollinator garden, your native plant garden, um, you might have Conoclinum which is a native plant, the mist flower with these lavender flowers here. If you see yellow spots on that and these brown sort of angular spots and bring that into the lab under the dissecting scope, you can see these pustules or sori that are full of spores and there are spores everywhere. And that's one thing about rust is you get spores everywhere. Um, they're very prolific. Magnify in a little bit, and you can see that some of these are dark brown, and these are teleospores, and some are more of a chestnut brown, and these are uridinia spores. And if you go ahead and make some cross sections through these, through the uridinia spores and then through the teleospores, the uridinia spores are pretty similar across a lot of species, and they're these beautiful sort of chestnut brown you can see the ornamentation. And again, when you think of how small these are, this is 100 microns. It's pretty amazing that you've got this sort of ornamentation. When you cut through the teleospores, or the telia and see the teleospores, sorry, my mouse keeps slipping. Um, these are the teleospores of the conoclinum rust. And these, I think, are really beautiful. Um, they're slightly ornamented. And this color is what they look like under the microscope. This wasn't enhanced in any way. This is just the color that the spores come out when you look at them, even under a white balanced microscope. I've seen this one come in a number of times to the um, identification table. This is the May apple or podophyllum rust, a lotus podophylli. This is May apple, of course. You see it in the forest quite commonly in the spring. And early in the spring, you'll see these diffuse orange patches. And if you look closely at those, those are Esia. These are Esial cups all together. It almost looks like a mass of insect eggs or something. But these are Esia and Esia spores. And I didn't quite make it to making a cross section of these. Otherwise, I'd have a micrograph of the Esia spores. But if you wait a little bit and go back, then what were diffuse orange spots become these yellow angular spots. And when you look at those underneath, you see all these little brown pinpoints. Um, and you might not think that's a rust, but that is the teleal stage of the same rust. And when you look at it under the microscope, the telia on this one are these amazing little spiky ornamented things. And this one even looks like it has a face with two eyes and a nose and a mouth here smiling at you. Um, and Again, I'm probably sounding like a broken record, but I just think it's absolutely amazing that you can go from seeing something like this to putting it under the microscope and seeing something like this. 
Another fungus that people often bring in um, that for the identification table is the cedar quince rust on service berry, or gymnosporangium clavipes on amelanchier. So that one we see quite often. This is downtown Silver Spring. This is on the fruits. These are ECL tubes. So these are the ECA of the rust. You bring it in and put it under the microscope. You can see these tubes. These are the peridial cells and then the spores that are everywhere. And you have to be careful when you're working with multiple samples because you end up with lots and lots of spores pretty much all over the place. Here's that tube under the microscope. In a little bit closer and you can see that these peridial cells are just these beautiful trapezoid um, shapes with the ECA spores around them. And in you, a little bit further at 60X, and you can see that they actually have this sort of wrinkled ornamentation on them. Um, the alternate host for Gymnosporangium clavipes is cedar. And some of the cedar rosaceous rusts make these sort of orange koosh balls, these large telial horns. This one just kind of makes an orange goo on the cedar. And so, you look at it, here's a brave soul holding a twig with the orange goo all over it. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, people might have kind of a visceral reaction to this, that this is not very appealing. But this is one that when you get it under the microscope, it is one of the most beautiful fungi I think I've ever seen. These are teleospores, they're orange, they look like little jewels. And these are the pedicels, so this is what's kind of propping up the spore, this is what holds up the spore. Um, and they form at this end. And so here's a, a grouping of the spores of the gymnosporangium clavipes. So again, this might not be so appetizing, but this I would hang on my wall. One other thing about spending a lot of time under the microscope is you start to kind of change your perspective on looking at the world around you. Um, so these backpacks were popular for a while, a number of years ago, maybe five, six years ago, and I would see people wearing them. And I would look at them and I would think, you know, do these people realize that they look like they are wearing a uridinia spore on their back? And I never mentioned it to anybody because I'm not quite that socially incapable, but um, it really does kind of change how you see even common objects around you. All right, so I sort of had tied myself into this scaffold of rust, smut, mildew, and mold because of this necklace and because of Mordecai Cubic Cook's book. So the next fungus on my list of fungi that I was collecting was smuts. And of course, when I imagined this talk and this meeting, I was gonna have the samples with me, we were gonna have the microscope, an opportunity for people to look through the microscope, and that didn't happen. Um, so smuts are also in the Basidiomycota. They have a life cycle that's sort of similar to rust, but more simple. They tend to form in the ovaries of their host plants. And so Tom went over corn smut in the last meeting. Um, you find smuts usually in the ovaries forming in the seeds of a plant. Um, the spores then the teleospores that are forming there stick with the seeds over the season and then they will germinate they'll form the basidium they'll form basidia spores they form a yeast phase and so that's why i was saying not all yeasts are ascomycetes you have some yeast phases in basidiomycetes as well They'll conjugate, they'll infect their host plant and grow back up into the ovaries and so the infection usually happens from the seed into the growing seedling, you won't see the smut in the plant normally until the plant produces seeds. And then you'll see the seeds full of the teleospores that are ready to begin the life cycle again. So you usually find smuts on grasses. So I went and I found a list at a USDA public database of what smuts people have found in Maryland. And for example, uh, Sorosporium was found on blue stem on Andropogon in Maryland in 1947 uh, in the Patuxent Research Refuge. And I have spent the last two summers looking at every single grass that I can find that I think might have a smut on it, and I haven't found a single one. So 
I tied myself into this title and this scaffold and I failed miserably at finding any smuts um, to share with you all. So I'm gonna keep looking. And if I find any, maybe I'll do one of the mini talks um, because they're out there. And I don't know if it's my inability to see them or I'm not looking at the right time. Um, not that many other people have found many smuts other than corn smut. So on iNaturalist, there are really only three um, observations all three of corn smut. Uh, there had been a fourth observation, but that was actually a false smut that someone had put in. And I talked to them and convinced them to put it over somewhere else. So um, if you find any smuts, I'd love to see them. Send me a picture, bring them in. And uh, it would have made this talk too long anyway, so we're gonna move on. These are some pictures though of smuts that I've seen in samples that we've gotten in. So this is one on something called porophyllum that should not have a P there. Uh, poor leaf, and it has this smut on it called pacaphora, which produces these little balls. And when you cut them, or when you mount them, you see them in cross section, and they've got all these wedges, and they're just beautiful. And this is a flag smut of wheat. Uh, we had an outbreak in Kansas a few years ago. Um, and this is one of the few that grows into the leaf, and you see this sort of twisted, deformed leaf, and these are the um, teliospores of Eurocystis tritici, the flag smut of wheat. So it forms these teliospores with these little sterile cells around it. So the basidiomycetes tend to be a lot more charismatic, kind of prettier than the ascomycetes. Um, but the ascomycetes are pretty nice as well. So if we're gonna move on with this structure of breast smut, mildews, and molds, um, the next group then is the mildews, and mildew is not a technical term and neither is mold. Um, they're just words that people use. Mildew was originally described from a word meaning honeydew, mildew, uh, that was used in the 1200s. And it came to mean a fungus by the 1500s, mostly because of city molds. So you'll commonly see it used as in mildew and mold in your bathroom or mildew and mold somewhere in your house. Um, and I'll see articles online where they talk about, oh, mildews are this and molds are this. And that actually is really meaningless. Um, mildew really is not a technical term at all or mold. But in plant pathology focused mycology, we do use the term mildew. And that's basically the only time that it's sort of a technical term. And so these mildews fall into two main categories, the downy mildews, which are in the O. mycota and absolutely not true fungi, and the powdery mildews, which are in the Asco mycota um, and are true fungi. So some of the ones that you might see in this area are sunflower downy mildew, basil downy mildew, and oak powdery mildew. So like I said, the downy mildews are not true fungi. Um, we have this phylogenetic tree, over here the fungi and the animals, plants over here, and the downy mildews are way over here in the stramena piles along with diatoms and some algaes. So they're quite genetically different, but they look a lot like fungi. They produce spores that look similar to fungi. They infect plants like fungi. So they were commonly grouped with fungi. So you might also grow giant sunflowers in your backyard. Um, and we, a couple years ago, grew a giant sunflower with commercial seed and at one point noticed these water-soaked lesions on some of the leaves of the sunflower. And when you turn it over, you'll see these white powdery structures. Bring those in to the lab and you can see all of this fuzzy growth, see it under the hand lens. A little bit further under the dissecting microscope and you can start to see these spiky little structures. And then under the compound microscope is when it really gets exciting and you start to see the hyphae and the spore bearing structures with all of their spikes and the spores. And this is at 60x. Again, here's your scale bar with 100 microns and you can see the little finger projections these spores, which are really called sporangia, 
um, depending on how they germinate. So that's Plasmopora halstedii, the sunflower downy mildew. One of the great things about working with um, microfungi is no one ever asks me if something is edible. So um, whereas when you go out and you point out a mushroom to somebody who may or may not be interested in mycology, one of the first questions is, is it edible? Which always kind of drives me crazy because I don't think that bird watchers and other naturalists get that question. Um, so I always tell people who cares <laughs> and, and we just move on. Um, but with the microfungi, no one ever asks me if they're edible. But you have probably eaten a lot of these fungi. Um, one thing that you notice when you're looking at plants under the microscope is that there are spores everywhere. They've all blown around in the wind. They've settled on leaves. So if you're gathering leaves from your garden, fresh lettuce, even if you wash it, there are probably spores hiding behind uh, leaf hairs and in some of the cracks and crevices. So you have all probably eaten Cladosporium and Penicillium and Aspergillus and a number of these other microfungi. And this is another one that you've possibly eaten. This, of course, is not a true fungus. It's a slime mold, or it's a oomycota, um, a stromenopile. But you might grow basil in your garden and notice some yellowing of the leaves. And if you turn those yellowed leaves over, you might see sort of a coating of this gray brown dust. This, I suppose, could be also considered some sort of fairy dust, but I don't know what kind of fairies those would be. If you bring this in and look at it under the dissecting microscope, you can start to see the spiky little structures producing spores. And then under the compound microscope, you can see this little tree structure producing the spores at the ends of the spiky tips. So here's sort of a tree-like spore-bearing structure, and here are the spores. And this is Paranospora belvarii. And this again is one, Perin means brooch. Um, so I guess somebody thought that these pretty little spores looked like a brooch um, and, and that this was sort of akin to fungal jewelry. So the other mildew group, of course, is the powdery mildews, and these are true fungi. So we're over here in the Ascomycota, um, and you'd probably call these parasitic microfungi. So the powdery mildews are some of the most charismatic of the Ascomycota. They're some of the bigger fungi. They're ones that people noticed early on. Um, this is a plate by an artist named Ernst Teckel. Um, he made beautiful drawings of diatoms and plants and mushrooms and some microfungi. So this is a fruiting body of a powdery mildew. This is another one. Uh, I think this is supposed to be another one, but he doesn't have that quite anatomically correct. Um, and this one as well. And these are beautiful. Um, and it, it also struck me one day when I went into a local beauty store and they had an advertisement for a particular fragrance line from a company called Nest. And this was the images on all of their packaging. So one of their flavors was ocean mist and coconut water. And the mood that that's supposed to induce apparently is calm because nothing says calm like parasitic microfungi powdery mildews. So I immediately bought a box and brought that home. And I was just thrilled about this. And I don't think the people at Nest realized that they were putting fungi on their, um, on their fragrance wipes. So here's a general ascomycete life cycle. And Dr. Nix talked last time about the mushroom life cycle. Um, Ascomycetes can be more complex, but this is kind of just generally how they reproduce. You have sexual reproduction that happens. Um, you have one N haploid mycelia that grows and forms a short-lived, usually heterokaryotic stage. Nuclei will fuse, you'll get a zygote with meiosis, 
that'll produce a spore bearing structure and you'll get spores. In asexual reproduction, you just have the mycelium, it forms spores, those germinate, form mycelium, and forms more spores. And this is what you usually see in most of the ascomycota. Um, for a long time, people gave these different names than this part. Now we're going to one fungus, one name. Through the power of DNA sequencing, we can tell which ones belong to which. Um, but for a long time, these had um, different names than when you saw this part. We grouped the asexual reproducing um, fungi into two groups generally, the coelomycetes and the hyphomycetes. So hyphomycetes make hyphae and they make spore bearing structures off of the hyphae and the spores are sort of naked, they're not within a fruiting body. The coelomycetes make fruiting bodies on a host and when you slice that open, you see all of the spores inside. In terms of sexual reproduction, that's where you see the ascomata, or the as and here's one ascoma, multiple ascomata, the fruiting bodies. You need to mount those under the microscope, and inside you'll see assi with the ascospores inside, and that's how you know that it's formed by sexual reproduction and not one of these asexual structures. When you look at it on the host, it can be impossible to tell. You just see the fruiting bodies. And so you have to put them under the microscope and cut them open in order to see what's inside and know whether you're dealing with the sexual state or the asexual state. So ascomycota, the name ascomycota comes from the term ascus. And you usually see that as sac. It really means wine sac. And if what you're seeing are assay like this, you might wonder what on earth those mycologists were thinking and what they were drinking to call this a wine sack. But if you consider that a lot of the first fungi that people were looking at, a lot of the first microscopic ascomycota were powdery mildews, you can see this is a powdery mildew ascus, and it does bear a striking resemblance to um, this sort of wine sack. So there we go. I was just gonna go through this powdery mildew because it does make a beautiful fruiting structure. The oak powdery mildew, Ericyphe alphatoides. Um, alphat means barley meal. So um, when you look up closely, I suppose someone thought that the powdery part of this looked like barley meal. This is an oak tree outside of the building where I work. I looked down and found a number of leaves one day and could see the powdery growth along the veins. If you look more closely, you can see that powdery growth and all of these little black dots that might be dirt or insect frass. If you look at them with a hand lens or under a dissecting microscope, it's maybe not the most exciting thing. You see these little black dots, but you get them under the compound microscope and you can see that these structures, which would fit two or three on the top of the line on the ruler that's underneath one of the numbers are actually making these fruiting structures with these appendages coming off of them. Here's an ascus with the ascospores inside, and here are two of the ascomata of the Ericyphe alphatoides. And here's a close-up zoom of one of the ends of one of the appendages. And again, when you think about how small this is, a hundred, one one thousandth of a millimeter, and you've got this incredible intricate structure. Um, it's just kind of an amazing thing to think about. So these illustrate that general ascomycete life cycle. So here you have the sexual reproductive ascomata with the assi inside. And powdery mildews, what you mostly see is the asexual state. So you see these spore bearing structures called conidiophores that are coming off of hyphae and they're producing these spores, asexual spores, which are called conidia. And that's the most common state that you see when you're looking at powdery mildews in the garden. So bee balm in the area commonly has a powdery mildew on it. We have lots of asteraceae with powdery mildews on them. Sunflower with powdery mildew on it. Um, you can walk down the street and see all sorts of plants with powdery mildew all over them. 
And if you were to look at these under the dissecting microscope, you can see the hyphae growing on top of the leaf, the conidia fours, the spore bearing structures coming off, and the conidia, the spores, the asexual spores forming in chains. And when you look at them more closely under the compound microscope, you can see them forming chains like that. Um, also on powdery mildews, you can see this fun hyperparasite. Uh, you see these sort of brown balls, and what happens is the hyperparasite grows up into this spore bearing structure into the conidia pore, and it takes it over and it produces a structure on top of it. I also put up this, this slide in this name because I love this name Ampelomyces quisqualis. Ample means grapevine. Quis means what, and quala means what kind. And I just think of this and the mycologist that named it, and it's like the what, what fungus? Um, what on earth is this thing? And why am I seeing it on my powdery mildew? Um, it also reminds you that uh, scientific names are usually really good passwords. This is not any password of mine, but these are often um, letters that you might put together that nobody else would. So this is what, this looks like under the microscope. This was a conidia for a spore bearing structure. It grew up through that, um, swelled, made this pycnidium, and out of the pycnidium, you have all of these spores emerging. All right, and our last group, the molds, or as I call them, fungi, my friends. And this is basically, these groups, the endophytes, the molds, the parasitic microfungi to a certain extent over here in the Ascomycota. And when you say mold, I think a lot of people think of something like this, your moldy orange, which still under the microscope is pretty beautiful. Um, I guess this kind of looks like clouds out the, the window of an airplane, which is something we might all forget what that looks like. Um, and even when you get that under the compound microscope, it's not as Dramatic is the powdery mildew, but it's still pretty beautiful. Um, this is the spore bearing structure. This is something called a phyllid. This is the, where the spore is produced. And you can see these spores being born off of the phyllids. So like I said, most of these ascomycetes, what you see is the asexual state. And the next ones I'm gonna show all are the asexual state of um, ascomycetes in the area. So I was gonna show four local molds, um, maple leaf spot or philistichta minima, apple scab, venturi inequalis, knotweed leaf spot, and a beet leaf spot. So if you're walking around the park, you might look up and see these brown spots on a maple tree. If you bring that in and look at it under the microscope, you can see these little fruiting bodies. And at this point, you don't know whether you're dealing with an ascomycete or an asexual state. You put the structure under a microscope. You can see here's the whole fruiting body. This little opening is called an osteole, and that's where the spores come out. If you cut it in half, you can see the spores that filled that fruiting body and the spores over here. And here they are kind of free and floating around. Um, this is Philistichta. It's one of my favorite fungi. I think they look like little mice. Um, when you see them all lined up on the spore bearing structure, it's pretty cute with their little tails out. They have a gelatinous sheath around them and then this little gelatinous tail. And Philistichta is one of the more common asexual fungi, asexual microfungi that you're going to see in the area. So you might have pawpaw trees in your yard. Uh, they get a really common spot that is full of Philistichta. Grapes, wild grape and grape relatives get a pretty common philistic spot. And all of those are going to have spores that look very similar to this with their little tail and their little sheath. Um, apple scab is one that you might see also commonly on crab apples in the area. Um, unfortunately, this picture did not. Here, I'm just gonna do this real quick. Ah.
So you'll see these black spots on the apple leaves. You'll see that on the fruit as well. And if you cut one of those leaves in half, you can see all these little spore bearing structures on the top of the leaf. And here's our little 100 micron scale bar. So that's how big this leaf is across. And when you get up more closely, you can see the spore bearing structure, the conidia pore, and the little conidium being produced on top of it. And here's another one. And you can see each of these is a scar where a spore was produced here and then broke off. Another one was produced here and broke off. Another one here, another one here. And these are called annelids, just like annulus on the stipe. These are annelids, little rings that are produced where the spores have broken off. And this is the lance-like spore of the apple scab. Um, there's a leaf spot that occurs on knotweed, on polygonum, which is a quite common weed in the area. So this is a huge patch of polygonum along Sligo Creek Parkway. Um, under the right circumstances, under the right um, rainfall and climate, you can see these yellow leaf spots on the polygonum. Sometimes they're really common. Bring that in and on the upper side of the leaf, you generally don't see anything, but on the underside, you see this effuse patch of growth, hence the name Passalora effusa. And that just kind of looks really fuzzy under the dissecting microscope. Um, when you put it under the compound microscope, you see tons and tons of spores. You see these little hands of spore bearing structures called fascicles. And then you can see the spore bearing structure and these spores, the conidia. And what's really neat about this is when you look at this little donut, this little circle here with a hole in the middle, this is what these spores came out of. So they get blown out of this little donut hole, like a balloon. They reach, oops, they reach pretty much um, mature size. They lay down cell walls or septa, and then they're ready to be blown off in the wind or moved on um, water droplets. So it's pretty amazing that you can see where these actually are coming from. And if you, again, look at the size, this is probably about a micron in size. And that's what's giving rise to all of this growth that you can see on this leaf. Uh, the last one I was gonna talk about is beet leaf spots or Cospora baticula. If you grow beets or chard or other Kenopodiaceae hosts, you've probably seen leaf spots with a red circle around them. Um, when you look at them under a hand lens or under the dissecting microscope, they're quite pretty with the greens and the purples. You can see the fuzzy little growth on them here. And then these are the spores under the microscope. And again, cirque means rod and spora means spore. So these are rod shaped spores. And if you're lucky, you'll get to see one being born. Again, here you can see these little scars and that's where the spores are coming from. They get blown out like really, really long thin balloons and then break off and head off in the wind or on a water droplet. All right. So I like to show this slide um, to people in, in a lot of talks, um, just to kind of put things in perspective. The number of fungal species we estimate at 1,500,000 on the conservative side, 6 million, 17 million, no one knows. But we know we have a lot of fungal species out there. And then of course we've described maybe 100,000, 144,000 is the latest number that I saw. So we've got a fraction of, species described versus how many fungal species there are. And DNA, of course, is being used nowadays more and more commonly to identify, characterize, and name fungal species. Um, and in a public database like GenBank, you have approximately 35,000, 40,000 taxa. So the number of sequences, it's the number of taxa, the number of separate groups that we have sequenced is a small fraction of the number of species described, which is a tiny fraction of the number of fungal species. So what's really cool about what I do is I get to spend a lot of time looking at things in this area and some in this area. So about every week I see something I've never seen before. 
Um, and I have a new favorite fungus almost every week, um, especially during normal times when we're getting in a lot of specimens. So I was just gonna go through one um, really quickly because I think it's beautiful and I just wanted to share it. So this was a sample that we got in from overseas. It's something in the Cupressaceae. This was the entire sample. So it's about uh, three, four centimeters long. Um, I think they were looking at this dark brown spot over here, but what I was interested actually was this little spot over here. And when you look at that more closely, you can see here's the scale. It's a little bit necrotic, drying out over here. You can see all of this dark stuff. And I didn't know what this was going to be, and I, I thought it might be something else. But I mounted it, and I saw all of these acai with ascospores inside. And normally you see eight ascospores because you have one round of meiosis and one round of mitosis. So seeing four ascospores, although in this case, this one didn't get the memo because it made six. But when you see four ascospores, it's something different. And so that was a huge clue for me. Um, and I was finally able to, after going through several keys and going back to a book from 1973, find a name for it, Didymacella tetramicrospora. And the really cool thing about that is this fungus was collected in Colorado in Estes Park on Juniper in 1940. It was described, given this name, in 1963. And there is only one specimen that exists in the world. And you could say that mine is the second specimen, but that was all I had. And I pretty much used up the entire fungus to make my slides so I can't put it in the herbarium. So I would still say that only one specimen exists in the world. So it's just an illustration of how this fungus came from a completely different country. Um, is it rare and overlooked and actually really common on Cupressaceae? Is it rare? Um, my feeling is it's probably actually not that rare and maybe really common, but just you don't have a whole lot of people going around looking at these parts of twigs in order to see what might be on there. But when you do look, you get rewarded sometimes with some pretty cool things. Um, we also see a lot of things that fall into this category. Um, this is one we see fairly re regularly. Um, it's on Ericaceae on palm, so on Cocos and Phoenix and other palms. Um, the spots are quite small. This little tiny dot is a fruiting body. But when you look at it under the microscope, you see these long, thin spores. They're 100 microns long, which is really, really big for this kind of um, size of fruiting body. Um, we have gotten it to grow in culture. We've sequenced it, and it's probably a new genus. And I'm working with someone on um, hopefully describing that. So um, thank you, everyone, for listening. And um, I'm happy to um, answer any questions that you might have. And if you feel like we have time, I'm also happy to go back and tell you the myco gossip about um, Mordecai and Lucy. That was awesome, Megan. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one of them was, has um, your, you're at USDA? Yes. Right? yes. Have you all been involved in the mysterious seeds that are getting <laughs> sent to everyone? Um, <laughs> we haven't been yet. That's been the talk of the office. Um, so, the original um, recommendation was to get in touch with your State Department of Agriculture, and then we've been in touch with State Departments of Agriculture. Um, the seeds are going to go to our botanists first to try to figure out what they are, and then if it's determined that we need to look at them further to look for any pathogens, then, then we would get involved. Um, so yes, everyone's been talking about those, but I haven't seen any of them yet. And then someone's asking, what is the USDA? It's the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Agriculture. Yeah. Oh, what oh, oh, what, oh, what agency in the USDA? Oh, what agency? Um, APHIS, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. So you're, you all are getting mostly things that are coming in from outside the country and inspecting them, is that right? Mostly. So shipments get inspected at the port by Customs and Border Protection. And then if they think they see, in our case, um, a plant disease on them, they get looked at locally at the port. If the port identifier can't identify it, it gets sent on to us. Um, we also work with state departments of agriculture and land-grant universities. So if they have something that they think is new to the US 
and might become a problem or might need some sort of regulatory action, then it gets sent to us. So, you know, before you go about cutting down trees or quarantining a field or whatever, you want a federal confirmation um, before you spend the money to do that. Okay. People want to hear the micro gossip. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> Let's see, I think I'm gonna go back to the pictures of Mordecai and Lucian, if I can. Those were pretty early on. That's, so again, I love um, mycohistory and mycologists just in general are eccentric people. I went to the um, meeting in Puerto Rico a few years back and I was sitting in the Baltimore airport and I looked around at the waiting area and I thought, I could tell you exactly who here is going to the mycology meeting. <laughs> and they were. When I got there, I saw them there. And I was like, yes, you can tell. So um, it's been really interesting to me that these folks that you might think were kind of boring and stayed and sat at their microscope or whatever, um, and they are long gone, so I'm not spreading anything, and this is all public knowledge. But um, Mordecai, a relative of his, wrote a biography. Mordecai Cubitt Cook, Victorian naturalist, mycologist, teacher, and eccentric. Um, and she was a, a distant relative of his, and she wrote quite an extensive thorough book. But I guess as she was researching it and looking at birth certificates and census records and whatnot, there were some things that didn't quite make sense. And so she was able to kind of piece together what Mordecai was doing as he was really busy with mycological societies and publishing dozens of books and all these other things, he um, also was busy at home. And so um, he married a woman named Sophia. And Sophia came into the marriage with a daughter, Annie. And I think Annie was about three. And so Mordecai and Sophia got married. And about 14 years later, a child was born in the household. And then another child and then another child. Um, and after about four children had been born, Annie got married to a man, had a daughter named Mabel, divorced that man, went back to live with Sophia and Mordecai, and two more children were born. So it turns out that all of Mordecai's children were not with Sophia. They were all with his stepdaughter, who had these five children with him, went and got married, had a child with the other man, and then went back to Mordecai. And it was sometime after she had the last child that I think she just got fed up with everything and she left Mordecai, left him with her youngest daughter and went off and they no longer lived together. So um, that was Mordecai's scandal. It's the stuff of um, soap operas. But yeah, apparently he, um, he had many children, none of them with his wife. Lucian over here, Lucian Underwood, was a naturalist. He was the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He wrote on spiders and mosses and mushrooms, um, taught at Columbia, um, wrote all these books. And then one night in 1907, um, Lucian apparently went nuts. Um, he went after his wife and daughter with a knife. So both of these kind of illustrate that marrying a mycologist might not ever be <laughs> a good idea either. <laughs> so he went after his wife and daughter with a knife. They escaped. They ran over to the neighbors, um, said Lucian's gone nuts. The neighbors went back over and in the meantime he had locked himself in a room um, and by the time they broke down the door they walked in and he had slit his throat. And that was um, in the newspapers and all around at the time. So read them for their for their mycology um, literature, but it's also kind of interesting to, to learn the scandalous stories behind their lives. Wow. All right, I'm not, I may have missed a couple questions if I did. I'm gonna... Um, I apologize, but lots of positive comments in the, co in the chat section and uh, especially for the cool micro photography. Um, so thanks for that. And someone asked, um, can you make the slides available? Yeah, of course. And we will also post this on our YouTube for folks to go back and, and watch the presentation as well. 
All right. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, absent, Megan. Absent any other input, I think we're drawing to a close here. Oh, and William, Tom Moore is saying we should make a plug for your new book that just came out. Um, well, <laughs> the you complete, so William Needham, the club president, has a, has a book that just came out called The Complete Ambler, which is a series of, of essays about nature in the D.C. area and includes several pieces about fungi. So th this will embarrass need William, but uh, The Complete Ambler, a, a hiker's notebook. I started to say hitchhikers. That tells you my age and William's probably. A Hiker's Notebook about the flora, fauna, and fungi of a healthy mind and body. It's 500 plus pages, just published. A great book. Really a delightful read. I'm still working on it. <laughs> it's going to take us all a little while. <laughs> I, I do thank you for the testimonial, and I appreciate the, the thought. I, I would hesitate to bring it up myself, so Tom and Elizabeth, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Um, and if there's any questions on that, I'll do that. But well, let me just close with thanking uh, Megan for, I would say, a tour de force uh, from just unbelievably, I'm, 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 I'm thinking of those, those things you see on the internet where it takes you from outer space down into somebody's yard and you realize how big the world really is on both ends. And uh, I just, the whole thing was uh, an incredibly well done piece showing a very complex subject, I think, in, in a very understandable and enjoyable format. So thank you very much for that. So absent any other uh, discussion, uh, we are nearing our end point. So I, I would close with uh, wishing you all well. Uh, our next meeting will, of course, be in September, Daniel Winkler. And absent any other thoughts, uh, again, thank you to Megan and to Lamont and to Mitch. And all of you, uh, and to all of you, good night.